Hey all, new day, new verses. We continue on into Matthew 27. Today we are doing verses 32 through 44, the crucifixion. And there were a couple things that stuck out to me. So let's get into it and have some deep study. Here we go. Along the way, 32, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cerna. The soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross, and they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And the soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, and when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. The sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their head in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. Leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Well, I know I normally dig into the verses themselves. This one here, when it kind of called me to do it a slightly different way. As I was digging into it, looking at the the different accounts, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, each one of them has this account. Each one of them tells it slightly differently. Luke says that Simon is carrying it behind him. John says that Jesus is the one carrying his cross. And, you know, there's this question, well, there's an inconsistency then? Because three of them says Simon's carrying it, and John is saying no. Well, yes, and it's also taking an understanding of what each one of them is trying to convey. John is not talking just about the physical cross, so when he is saying that Jesus is carrying it by himself, he is talking about the spiritual sense of it. That Jesus is doing this in this moment, dying in our place. So that he is carrying the actual cross, that Simon cannot carry, that none of us can carry, that he carries alone and died in our place to set right. How Luke says that one of these two people, these revolutionaries, these criminals who decided to do it the world's way instead, rather than path of exile kind of revolutionary building, the way in the wilderness kind of way of doing it, that eventually one of them says, look, hey, we deserve this, he doesn't. And it's like, okay, so why is that different from Matthew? For the same reason that it's hard to, you know, there's a pop culture movie, that Point of View, that each person is seeing something different. And Luke, you know, he's doing the research on it. He's like, okay, and it's conveying what he's conveying. Matthew, here, I see something beautiful about the myrrh and the bitter gall. That it's wine mixed with this. Some versions say it is myrrh. Some versions say it is, it's essentially a numbing agent. And Jesus doesn't let himself go numb to it. He bears it out. The guard, the Roman, who gave him or offered the wine to be numb, the same reason that one of the people hanging next to him says, let's stop this. Eventually, you get tired of behaving like the world if you don't belong to it. Eventually, you cannot continue to look at the wrongs and say that they are right. Eventually, you get to the point where you can no longer just dismiss things. That you just have to say, okay, something different has to be done because what is going on is evil. It's wrong. It's screwed up. And I love the fact that in Mark's version of after the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, that, that it's a Roman centurion, I believe it's in uh, Mark's, that he's saying, yeah. This this is the Son of God. It's that moment of realizing. It's that moment of realizing that His way is so much more different. Because as the priests and religious leaders, and, and key word there, religious leaders, these, these are a group that are missing entirely what's going on. 
So that the crowning moment where Jesus is enthroned as Christ is here in these moments, between 32 and 56, where Jesus is dying on the cross, crucified in our place, where we can leave these things, these troubles, the the parts of the world that try and beat and cripple and destroy us, and we can lay it at the cross, we can lay it at his feet. We can know that he died that we may not have to, that we don't have to do it that way. We don't have to do it that game style. We do not have to repeat it. And I know I say this quite often. It's because I want to start getting into the beautiful, paradoxical, or seemingly paradoxical nature of Christianity as its truest form. Just following after and believing in the Christ. Because where religious leaders are saying, well, come down and we'll believe you, no, you won't. You won't. He could have come down off that crest, or that cross right then and there and said, okay, see, you really am. Wouldn't have mattered. All the miracles they saw in front of him wouldn't have mattered. There's a reason John points out the fact that they were trying to kill Lazarus because of how many people were believing in Jesus just because, like, well, yeah, but he brought a guy back from the dead. Like, <laughs> you, 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 guy back from the dead, we should probably listen. These Pharisees, Sadducees, this suppose that their scribe and elders don't see it. They don't see truth. They don't see that in this moment where they are jeering him, their true king is being enthroned. That the one person that these leaders have been looking for, longing for, searching for, praying for, begging to come, is right there in front of them, walking out exactly what Isaiah said would happen being the kind of person that was promised in Genesis and by Moses. <laughs> being the per- Yeah, defeating the serpent once and for all. Right there, every promise being fulfilled in that moment. Just before the resurrection, because he is proven innocent, because he is the innocent one. Just obedience. It's... It's seemingly confusing because it doesn't work the way the world does. How can a point of death be an enthronement? How does water come from rocks? How does bread come from heaven? How does the sound of shouting and the blowing of a shofar shatter walls? How is water a walkable surface? How does a jar of oil continue to pour out until... Gallons upon gallons have poured out into counter into many containers. How can a few loaves of bread and a few fish feed thousands? Because it's operating in a place of trust that God will see to it, that He will use all things to bring about His glory for those who love Him. He's on our side. They're more with us than against us. These aren't just bumper sticker phrases. These are truths. They're truths that we do not often really think about, really hold to, really embrace the fact that with this, God has seen to it. He has seen to it that we need not act like religious leaders and Pharisees and Sadducees and those who are lost. We do not have to continue blindly stumbling around in the dark because we are no longer blindly stumbling around in the dark. We are His. And in primes when we are in Death's Valley, not sure which way to turn, we are to turn to the Word, to the light, to the One who is the source of all life. I know a shorter one here compared to yesterday, especially with as much heaviness as on the crucifixion. And if I'm honest... To truly embrace that, I would say go watch The Passion. Go watch something along those lines that can truly convey this idea to you. However, it is easiest to be done. Because this is it right here. This is the moment history records, shows that the battle is won. That in this moment of enduring the last abuses 
before his death and the moment where we are set free. He's there. You, you have to see this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have to see everything he goes through hanging there. The being jeered at, the being spit on, the centurions that are so tired of making fun of him that they're going, okay, yeah, we've officially hit tactless. Maybe we should stop. The conversation between John and his mother saying, woman, this is your son, this is your mother. Looking after his mother, knowing he would be dying. Seeing to everything. As the final soul that's sitting there on the cross at that last moment saying, please don't forget me. Jesus saying, I won't. Showing mercy even in that point of agony. On the cross, just before he cries out, Ela, Ela, Hama Shabbat and I. But we will get into tomorrow. All the love and the kindness and compassion that he pours out. That many would say, oh, it's an inconsistency without taking a moment to see. No, no. It is the heart of what is being conveyed. Is. Matthew doesn't point out who is there until later. What we'll get into tomorrow. He doesn't point out these conversations. He doesn't point out everything that you that Jesus goes through. He simply points out what he's been pointing out all this time. The leaders who think they are in the know, who are spitting on their king, are at this moment missing entirely the fact that Jesus is the King of the Jews. He's the Jewish Messiah. We as Goyim are welcomed, and Gentiles are welcome in to be part of that family. I mean, God is keeping His promises to bless all of us through the descendants of Abraham. Doesn't mean to put people up on a pedestal. We are all equal before him. It means to enjoy the fact that this event, this moment where he is dying on the cross, it is remembered by so many. Not just recorded in here, but out here. All of Christendom, who is held to the last hope of saying, I know this is crap, but my God will see through it. My God will see me through. How many people who cling to him knowing that it will be okay? Not because the world has offered any proof to say as such. In fact, most of the time the world and the enemy do everything they can to prove otherwise. And it is faith. Same kind of faith Abraham had. In the moment of Isaac, God will provide the ram. He will. It's faith. It's obedient faith. Well, I don't know how I can have obedient faith like that. One foot in front of the other. A little bit at a time. Not about, pro uh, not about perfection, about progress. We're made in His image, right? Shaped by His hands. Wouldn't it be more about being shaped than about just being spoken to being, like the sun, moon, or stars? Because don't get me wrong, those are nifty. The human beings are so much cooler. Especially when we start acting humanely. Especially when we stop trying to numb ourselves and instead love. And in places of sorrow, show mercy. And in places of struggle and heartache, remember that God loves us. And so, we act on that love. And we act on it in trust and in faith. Because He is consistent. This is both milk and honey and meat and potatoes. This is the fundamental understanding that we are not our own. So why would we think or act that doing it our own way would be sufficient? We need Him because He is sufficient. And when we rely on Him because He is sufficient, we are enough. It's just trusting Him to be God. Because that is what Jesus is doing in this moment. 
He's trusting his Abba, our Abba, who we can call on by his blood, by his grace. Our Abba. He is trusting. Jesus is trusting his Abba in this moment. He could get off that cross if he wanted to. He could send an ask for a legion of angels if he wanted to. And instead, in this moment, in the face of the jeering, he is saying, not my will, but your will be done by walking it out. Something that's a blessing to get to see. I will see you guys more than likely tomorrow as we continue on with verses 45 through 56, the death of Jesus and the triumphant moment of such beauty where the serpent is finally cr is crushed. We're in the in-between and the birth pains where we wait to finally come home. We can rejoice and celebrate. Because in the moments to come that we will read about, we know that the pain of Friday becomes the joy of Sunday. So we can have hope. Because even when it is darkest, He makes a way. And He'll guide us through as we let Him. I'll see you guys then. May his favor be upon you. Know that you are loved and do not give up hope. Because you are loved. You are wanted. And all you need to do is turn to him before he comes back home. So hold out. He'll always see you through. I'll see you then.